and book fair. I'm Susan Jackson Rogers, a member of the AWP Board of Directors and Western Council Chair. For accessibility purposes, I'd like to offer a physical description of myself. I'm a white woman with chin length brown hair, wearing blue framed eyeglasses, a black turtleneck, and sparkly dime sized earrings. We are delighted to bring you this event today. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the University of Iowa, sponsors of today's event and premier sponsor of the 2021 Conference and Book Fair. Thank you also to the Tulsa Artists Fellowship who helped Joy Harjo to make this very special keynote possible. Our literary partners and sponsors allow ADUP to present these extraordinary literary events and help us keep our conference affordable and accessible. A thank you to all of our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. This event is being live captioned through stream text. Please find the link to access stream text from your browser in the event description. For those viewing on demand later, there will be a transcript available. We are thrilled and honored to have the US Poet Laureate Joy Harjo as our keynote speaker this year. Joy Harjo's nine books of poetry include An American Sunrise, Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings, How We Became Human, New and Selected Poems, and She Had Some Horses. Harjo's memoir, Crazy Brave, won several awards, including the Penn USA Literary Award for Creative Nonfiction and the American Book Award. She is also the editor of the landmark anthology of Native Nations Poetry, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. Her anthology, Living Nations, Living Words, First Peoples Poetry, will be released in May from W.W. W. Norton and the Library of Congress. Poet Warrior, a memoir, will be released in September 2021. She is the recipient of the Ruth Lilly Prize from the Poetry Foundation for Lifetime Achievement, the 2015 Wallace Stevens Award from the Academy of American Poets for Proven Mastery in the Art of Poetry, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the William Carlos Williams Award from the Poetry Society of America, and the United States Artist Fellowship. In 2014, she was inducted into the Oklahoma Writers Hall of Fame. A renowned musician, Harjo performs with her saxophone nationally and internationally, solo and with her band, The Arrow Dynamics. She has five award-winning CDs of music, including the award-winning album, Red Dreams, A Trail Beyond Tears, and Winding Through the Milky Way, which won a Native American Music Award for Best Female Artist of the Year in 2009. Joy's new album, I Pray For My Enemies, will be released on March 5th. We are so honored to have Joy deliver the keynote with us live this evening, and we'll also offer live closing commentary at the end of the evening in conversation with Ruth Dickey from the AWP Board of Directors. We thank you so much for attending and for your continued support of AWP. We hope you are well and that you enjoy this event. So here we are, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, thank you, Jeff and Duet. And uh, what's your name back there? Chris. Chris, that's all right. Chris back there. And and up here we have Nathan Eicher and, and Jack Wolf joining, uh, joining here for this AW keynote in Strange Times. And we're in Kansas City, virtually north of here. And I think we're all in below freezing weather. So this is called a coherent shape to brokenness. I lay my body down. My mind is not slow for sleep. It has no place to rest. Not in this country, this government, this time of the heavy turning earth. An eternity can exist in a moment, an hour, or in the song bodies of humble sparrows who dream in the tree of life as it breaks through concrete and sorrow. <laughs> Five trains cross 
downtown Tulsa. The man chased by demons screams out. He roams this area day and night. His bad dreams never sleep. They beg our ears for mercy. A ruined goddess dressed in street light begs a ghost for change. She wears a crown of cigarette smoke. Tulsa is the corrupted form of the Muskogee name for town or old town, Tulsee or Tallahassee. Down the street, the ashes of a fire carried in the forced march from the southeast was rekindled beneath the council oak tree. The tree is still there. Our rooted story holding in place the memory of fire. Now a pandemic haunts these lands and the keepers of these lands. Those viral killers approach my mind to plant fear. They act familiar, shake hands, make treaties. They sit down without being invited. We recognize them as part of the great disturbance. I give my mind the task of holding the door open for the ancestors, the guardians, the winds. When I sing poetry, there is no way for evil. Once in the middle of the country in the early of my life, I drove my children through the night in our small pickup back from a winter break in Tulsa, north to Iowa City for the beginning of the spring semester. We stopped for gas a few hours before we made it to Kansas City. Cold winds had blown and blasted us for hours. Snow was now drift walking the highway. My son slid out to clean the windshield. The baby yawned, then sleep talked. I was just dreaming someone somewhere else and I wonder if someone somewhere else was dreaming us. Then she went back to the origin place of poetry, the eternal road between myth and the ordinary, between history and odyssey. We filled up with gas, kept driving to the icy darkness. Now here we are together on the verge of shift in our drive through what feels like the endless night of uncertainty. Nothing will be the same after this is over. What will we know when this page is done? Who will we be? Will we survive the fires, the hatred, the heat, the rage? The sickness has taken so many in our ceremonial ground community, we have lost several culture carriers. Others are on ventilators turning toward the next sacred story. We have lost so many to acts of hatred and fear, not just now, but since the beginning of this story we call America. The pandemic has shown us just how far away we have been from ourselves. Now we need to figure out where we are going together and how to get there together. I bow down to the story keepers, the keepers of poetry. I am reminded of the water spider who when the earth was covered with water carried an ember on her back so we could make fire to keep the story going. Everything is a prayer in the becoming as she approaches us swimming through time. Hence Jay or Stongo, or welcome to the first virtual AWP keynote. We are virtually in Kansas City. And as we begin to give blessing to this event, let's honor the original keepers of these lands. Kansas City, long before it was named Kansas City, has been a gathering place in the middle. It has always been a crossroads for many Native Nations peoples, including the Kansa, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Comanche, Kiowa, Osage, Pawnee, Missouri, and Wichita. Even the Ice Age stopped here at Kansas City. Here at the convergence of the Missouri and Kansas River, Kansas River is the source of ragtime, Kansas City jazz and St. Louis blues. Miles Davis grew up on the other side of East St. Louis, Willie Cather to the north, and don't forget Charlie Parker. 
The winds like to play as they fly off the Rockies in this, these post ice age fields. They are always stirring something up. I speak to you from Tulsa, Oklahoma, from the Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation. We are at the border of three native nations that also include the Osage and Cherokee. We honor and acknowledge the keepers of the lands, lands represented by all who are gathered here in this digital room. These original keepers past and future who care for these lands. Every place has guardians whose responsibility it is to tend that person or place. There are guardians of cities, mountains, plants, and animals, saxophones, for all beings and states of mind on this planet, Earth. These guardians are real, and in healthy societies, they are active. When the guardians or keepers of these lands are forcibly removed, massacred, and their life waste stolen through the theft and warehousing of children, when female power is no longer standing equal with male power, then the lands suffer. We all suffer. The waters become polluted, fires are out of control, storms become massive and aggressive, and the earth trembles. There is confusion and destruction among all those who inhabit the land these times. As we gather here at this crossroads of becoming, we acknowledge the source of the gifts of our living, for without this earth or Iganajaga, we would be without shelter, clothing, food, or inspiration. Consider that the earth mind architectures and aesthetics shape the mother root of our imagination here. Agasama, Hisagara Masi, Pomadi, Molwe, Tawigas, Pogahoyan, Ye Giadi, Mong, Agatlajka Heathlin, Pogalajan, Abiyathlis. When my third granddaughter's body was forming, I watched and listened to what was going on in the atmosphere to give a clue about this incoming family member, what she would need once she arrived here to take on her part of the story. A powerful story was making the rounds in the native community where I was living in New Mexico. There was a Navajo woman of a righteous nature who lived far out on the reservation in a hogan the traditional home of the Navajo or Diné people there. She still prayed every morning with cornmeal, tended the altars of living, took care of her sheep and was loved and well-respected by her relatives and neighbors. She was also blind. She was visited one day by the Holy Ones. As her Hogan filled with the powerful presence of sacredness, the Holy Ones told her, as they towered over her, that they came to give a warning to the people. We are nearing times where we will experience earth changes, famine, and strife. People, because people are forgetting their original teachings. The holy ones instructed her to tell everyone to keep hold of their traditional ways, which meant attending to prayer and minding their attention in all things because it matters for the outcome of all of us, for all life forms on this earth, or we all suffer. The traditional ways and rituals of all earth peoples are kept in containers of poetry, song, and stories. It is how we know who we are, where we are coming from, and who we are becoming. I knew that my granddaughter was bringing in special gifts that would assist with these times we are moving into, times in which we are reckoning with our lack of respect and attention to what matters in this place. I told this story at a performance in Flagstaff near one of the sacred mountains for the Dene people. Many of the Dene people there nodded their heads in remembering as I told about the Holy Ones. For Holy Ones to touch down in that manner is powerful and dangerous. Everyone must pay attention. Afterwards, one of the women came up to me and remarked, I saw the footprints of the Holy Ones in the sand in front of the Hogan. They were very long and narrow. The times the Holy Ones spoke of, we are now in those times. 
In this time at the crossroads of brokenness, we are watching and listening for what stories will nourish us. At this cliff edge of becoming, there will be no turning back. These are the times that invite tricksters who disturb the waters. It was a time like this that Robert Johnson, blues guitarist, met the devil at the crossroads one humid night somewhere in the dark of history. And it is times like these we face the most cunning of tricksters. We might even find a trickster in the seat of power. We have always had clowns and tricksters in every culture. They inhabit the power places because their role is to remind us that though we may hold and even wield power, power does not belong to us. It is meant to be shared. The Muscogee trickster is Chofi or rabbit. This is a rabbit story that tells a version of the story of those times we are in now. for this one there was enough for everyone until somebody got out of line we heard it was rabbit fooling around with clay and the wind everybody was tired of his tricks and no one would play with him and he was lonely in this world so rabbit thought to make a person and when he blew into the mouth of that crude figure to see what would happen, the clay man stood up. The rabbit showed him how to steal corn. Then rabbit showed and the clay man obeyed. Then rabbit showed him how to steal a chicken and the clay man obeyed. Then he showed him how to steal someone else's wife and that clay man obeyed. Rabbit felt important and powerful, and Clay Man felt important and powerful. And once that Clay Man started, he could not stop. Once he took that chicken, he wanted all the chickens. Once he took that corn, he wanted all the corn. And once he took that wife, well, he wanted all the wives. He was insatiable. Then he had a taste of gold. He wanted all the gold. Then it was land or anything else he saw his wanting only made him want more, more, more. Soon it was countries, then it was trade. The wanting infected the earth. We lost track of the purpose and meaning for life. We began to forget our songs, our stories. We could no longer see or hear our ancestors or talk with each other across the kitchen table. Forests were being mowed down all over the world and Rabbit had no place left to play. Rabbit's trick had backfired Rabbit tried to call that clay man back. But when the clay man wouldn't listen, Rabbit realized he'd made a clay man with no ears.
in the clay man aftermath, we witnessed democracy dangled by an armed mob from the steps of the Capitol. A viral pandemic elbowed through the barrier of forgetfulness to infect we who thought we had a drug for everything. Thousands confronted the open wound of racial injustice. A wound will not heal until it is cleaned out of all that has infected it or will reinfect and poison the body, even kill it. Land developers from Europe imported African peoples as slaves for their economic and land development projects here on native land, nations lands and all over the world. The American dream moved from East to the West to plant civilization based on a narrative that told them that the land was given to them because they were culturally and racially superior that the earth was not a living being, rather a storehouse to be raided. This false narrative continues to infect and disrupt the quality of life for all living things here on this planet. Even those who cling to the raft of superiority and drag it behind them as we wait at the crossroads while we figure out collectively the direction in which to go. No one can own this land. We might institute law, and publish legal documents, make political lines on maps or divide according to religious ideology, but these claims are without merit to Earth herself. When we were assembling the digital map for my Library of Congress project of mapping contemporary native poets, living nations, living words, we used a map that contains no visible political boundaries delineating states or cities, not even the names of rivers, mountains, or other geographical features. The map is the color of earth and water. We can imagine trees, rivers, lakes, oceans, fields, and mountains. This alternative mapping project, a project meant to change the narrative of our use of language and its relationship to land is a deliberate shift to the way we approach and experience the story of our living on this planet. The map then is no longer marked by brokenness. There are no fences, no lines of ownership. We are the land. Once at a gathering of indigenous peoples in a village outside Quito, Ecuador, high in the Andes, where we strolled and climbed through clouds, a striking Bolivian, Bolivian native woman stood up and addressed the women's circle. She asked those of us from up north, why do you call yourselves America? We are all America, from the north to the south. She continued to assert that the Western Hemisphere is a person from the Arctic to Tierra del Fuego, a living being for whom we are all charged with care, with singing into continuation as the Holy Ones reminded us those years ago when my granddaughter was preparing to be born. I am reminded how the words of the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda climbed up the backbone of the Americas into my hands in a book of love poems, The Captain's Verses, a gift from a professor. This one, the earth is a ritual in the manner that all poems, all stories, all songs are rituals. The green earth has yielded to everything, yellow, gold, harvests, farms, leaves, grain, but when autumn rises with its spacious banner, it is you I see. For me, it is your hair that separates the tassels. I see the monuments of ancient broken stone, but if I touch the stone scar, your body responds to me. My fingers recognize suddenly, shivering your warm sweetness. I pass among the heroes recently decorated by the earth and the dust, and behind them, silent with your tiny steps. Is it you or not you? Yesterday, when they pulled up by the root to have a look at it, the old dwarf tree, I saw you come out looking at me from the tortured and thirsty roots. And when sleep comes to stretch me out and take me to my own silence, there is a great white wind that destroys my sleep and from it falls leaves. They fall like knives upon me, draining me of blood and each wound has the shape of your mouth. In this poem, the beloved is earth and the earth that beloved, every intimate human ritual dresses the back and forth of the flickering dark and light. 
The poem continues through the monuments of history. The wars of history do not favor trees. I remember standing in the special collections room at Southern Methodist University, holding images of a Civil War photographer who documented the environmental damage of war. The destruction of human life was monumental, as was the destruction of trees. The poem ends at the opening at the beloved's mouth, which is the same shape as the wounding of the earth. It is from this wound that we speak poetry. The poet, poem is made a ritual of the wounding. The poem places us in the wound, the wound of your hair that separates the tassels. The wound is bearing the fruit, corn is flowering. This is a love poem for the earth, for the poet who is also earth. Isn't every poem a ritual to bring one closer to the beloved, attracting us to the fire of living and dying? What is broken is left in the field to ponder, like the boulders from the ice age that litter the flat Kansas landscape. Bones will bleach in the sun and the rain. History will be monuments left in stone and words. Then they will be swallowed up by earth and time. Poems are markers scattered at the crossroads of time, history, and mythic emergence. At this particular crossroads of brokenness and wounding, we have turned to poetry. Site visits for poetry organizations like the Academy of American Poets and the Poetry Society of America have skyrocketed. We have hungered for poetry, for what poetry offers us in this year of racial reckoning of the COVID pandemic, of the device of political warring that is dividing the country. It is the 100 year anniversary since the Tulsa race massacre, just a few blocks away, where the wealthiest black community in the country in 1921 called Black Wall Street was burned down and many killed by white citizens. As the search goes on for mass graves, poems are being commissioned and written as testimony and witness. So this act will not go unremembered, unspoken. So maybe the future generations will listen and take heed. I keep returning to a poem by the poet Natasha Trethewey, imperatives for carrying on in the aftermath, for illumination, to give ritual to grieving for moving on. She concludes her poem with, ask yourself what's in your heart that reliquary, blood locket and seat bed, and contend with what it means. The folk saying, you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest, or like you, you carry her corpse on your back. There are many corpses on the back of this country and we will continue to carry them until we have the right tools, the right words to bury them so that the fertile human field of becoming can flower with justice and equality. To honor our survival and help direct us at the crossroads, this song.
can change the story. The story of a violent hierarchy that follows in the wake of the Papal Bulls, proclaiming indigenous peoples as non-humans for land and resource theft and slavery, to manifest destiny which opens up the West and the world for taking. Set in place a caste system that places value according to skin color, culture, sexual identity, and economic standing. We can turn to honoring female power without whom there is no life. Rivers, mountains, lands, and other animal and elemental inhabitants will be respected co-inhabitants. Once a story was given to me in a dream after a moral impasse in a creative writing teaching job, I called out to the dark, how do we change the story? That night, the dreaming took me to that deep inner pool of insight. As artists, we are on alert for such insights because our art demands that we are challenged, never comfortable. We often find ourselves at ascetic artistic crossroads. Then we need our dreams to show us the way to change the story. We do not only dream as individuals, but we dream as a collective. It is in the times when people dreamed and thought together as one being. That doesn't mean there weren't individuals. In those times, people were more individual in personhood than they are now in common assertion, the common assertion of individuality. One person kept residence on the moon, even while living in the village. Another was a man who dressed up and lived as a woman and was known as the best seamstress. I have traveled to the village with a close friend who is also a distant relative. We are related to nearly everyone by marriage, clan, or blood. The first night after our arrival, a woman is brutally killed in the village. Murder is not commonplace. The evil of it puts the whole village at risk. It has to be dealt with immediately so that the turbulence will not leave the people open to more evil. Because my friend and I are the most obvious influence, it is decided that we are to be killed to satisfy the murder, to ensure the village will continue in a harmonious manner. No one tells us we're going to be killed. We know it, my bones know it. It is unfortunate, but that is how things must be. The next morning, my friend and I have walked down from the village to help gather for the next meal when we hear the killing committee coming for us. I can hear them behind us with their implements and stones and their psychic roar of purpose. As they come to kill us, I thank this body that has been my clothing on this journey. It has served me well for protection and enjoyment. I hear, I can still hear it. The crunch of bones as the village mob who was sent to do their job slams us violently. I feel my body's confused and terrible protest then my spirit leaps out above the scene and I watch briefly before circling toward the sea. I linger out over the sea and my soul's guardian who has been with me through the stories of my being says, you can go back and change the story. My first thought was like, yeah, why would I wanna do that? I am free of the needs of earth existence. I can move like wind and water, but then because I am human, not bird or whale, I feel compelled. What do you mean, change the story? Then I am back in the clothes of my body outside the village. I am back in the time before the, between the killing in the village and my certain death in retribution. Now, what am I supposed to do? I ask my spirit. I can see no other way to proceed through the story. My spirit responds, you know what to do, look and you will see the story. And then I am alone with the sea and the sky. I give my thinking to time and let them go play. 
It is then I see a man in the village stalk a woman. She's not interested in him, but he won't let go. He stalks her as he stalks his prey. He is the village's best hunter. He stalks her to her home, and when no one else is there, he trusses her, kills her, and drags her body out of her house to the sea. I can see the trail of blood behind them. I can see the footprints in blood as he returns to the village alone. The people are gathering and talking about the killing. I can feel their nudges towards my friend and me. I stand up with a drum in my hand. I say, I have a story I want to tell you. And then I begin drumming and dancing to accompany the story. It is pleasing and the people want to hear more. They want to hear what kind of story I am bringing to my village. I dance and sing and tell the story of a hunter. He is the best hunter of the village. I sing about the relationship to the animals he kills and how he has fed his people and how skilled he is as he walks out onto the story to call his prey. Then I tell the story of the killing of an animal who is like a woman. I talk about the qualities of the woman whom the man sees as prey. By now, the story has its own spirit that wants to live. It dances and sings and breathes. It surprises me with what it knows. With the last step, the last hit of the drum, the killer stands up as if to flee the gathering. The people turn together as one and see him. They see that he has killed the woman and it is, is his life that must be taken to satisfy the murder. When I return to present earth time, I can still hear the singing. I get up from my bed and dance and sing this story. We now gather here in the middle at the crossroads to shift the collective story, to carry ourselves forward with caches from the storehouse of American literature, arts, music, including indigenous peoples, all peoples, because for too, all peoples, anyone who for too long have been left out of the American story. First though, we must call ourselves back the parts of ourselves that have been lost in despair, grief, and justice and violence. But to say, to do so, we need the right words. We turn to the Kiowa poet and storyteller in Scott Mamaday, who often stood alone as a Kiowa man in the academy. He understands that words have power to make or destroy a world. He was taught by this by the elders who stood before him in the power of ritual and ceremony at Rainy Mountain. He reminds us, a word has power in and of itself. It comes from nothing into sound and meaning. It gives origin to all things. To call ourselves back, we return to the beloved poet Gwendolyn Brooks, born in Topeka, Kansas, who is a lyric witness and beacon, first to her south side of Chicago neighborhood with her poetry, then to the whole country and the generations who continue to follow and look up to her light and listen. She inspired all of us to make it through. She says, when you love a man, he becomes more than a body. His physical limbs expand and his outline recedes, vanishes. He is rich and sweet and right. He is part of the world, the atmosphere, the blue sky and the blue water. When you love a wounded country, a wounded earth, then she becomes more than a body. We are rich, sweet and right. We are part of the atmosphere, the blue sky and the blue water. We are poets, storytellers, singers, truth tellers, keepers of this place. We make a coherent shape. We make a coherent shape to brokenness. For calling the spirit back from wandering the earth in its human feet. 
Put down that bag of potato chips, that white bread, that bottle of pop. Turn off that cell phone, computer, and remote control. Open the door, then close it behind you. Take a breath offered by friendly winds. They travel the earth gathering essences of plants to clean. Give it back with gratitude. If you sing, it will give your spirit lift to fly to the star's ears and back. Acknowledge this earth who has cared for you since you were a dream planting itself precisely within your parents' desire. Let your moccasin feet take you to the encampment of the guardians who have known you before time, who will be there after time. They sit before the fire that has been there without time. Let the earth stabilize your post-colonial insecure jitters. Be respectful of the small insects, plants, and animal people who accompany you. Ask their forgiveness for this harm we humans have brought down upon them. Don't worry. The heart knows the way. Though there may be high rises, interstates, checkpoints, armed soldiers, massacres, and wars, and those who will despise you because they despise themselves. The journey might take you a few hours, a day, a few years, a hundred, a thousand, or even more. Watch your mind. Without training, it might run away and leave your heart for the immense human feast set by the thieves of time. Do not hold regrets. When you find your way to the circle, to the fire kept burning by the keepers of your soul, you will be welcomed. You must clean yourself with cedar, sage, or other healing plant. Cut the ties you have to failure and shame. Let go of the pain you are holding in your mind, your shoulders, your heart, all the way to your feet. Let go of the pain of your ancestors to make way for those who are heading in our direction. Ask for forgiveness. Call upon the help of those who love you. Call yourself back. You will find yourself caught in the creases and corners of shame, judgment, and human abuse. You must call in a way that your spirit will want to return. Speak to it as you would a beloved child. Welcome your spirit back from its wandering. It will return in pieces, tatters. Gather them together. They will be happy to be found after having been lost for so long. Your spirit will need to sleep after it is bathed and given clean clothes. Now you can have a party. Invite everyone you know who loves you and supports you and keep room for those who have no place to go. Make a giveaway and remember, keep the speeches short. Then you must do this. Help the next person find their way through the dark. Good night, digital Kansas City. Perched in the middle of the country, between two oceans, leaning toward the Rockies in the distance. A city where the blues took root, a city of railroads, cattle, and jazz, a naval court place for the singers and speakers, the writers and poets who lived in the concentric circles of this town that continues for miles and years across country roads and up and down the rivers of life. Good night, this pandemic, this separation, these losses, these moments of shift and celebration have taught us that we need the gathering together. It is spiritual food. We are a small and green planet circling in mystery through generations, through war and peace, through now. Thank you.
crazy fine poets there and we're gonna hear a song we'll be standing at the corner of 12th street and vine with all the poets novelists there memoirs we'll be standing at the corner of 12th street and vine with our kansas city stories babes and bottles of kansas city wine well we might take a train we might take a plane we're gonna be safe and we're gonna zoom it just the same we're going to kansas city kansas city here we come there's some crazy fine poets there and we're gonna hear a song Thank you, Jack Wolf. Thank you, AWP. Thank you, this beautiful earth. These stories are, uh, we'll make it through.
Hello. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you so much for that extraordinary keynote and for your words and your music. I know I speak for everyone watching when I say it was a tremendous gift. I'd love to start tonight by hearing what was your process in creating that and particularly for bringing together musicians in this time of pandemic? Well, I've been thinking about it for some time, of course, and it's certainly an unusual moment in our history and in a very particular moment in our history. And I, it's the first virtual, you know, the first virtual AWP. And so, of course, there was a lot going on. And I was thinking about Kansas City and the place in the center of the country and kind of the heart of the country and the broken heart you know, the broken heart of a country. And uh, that kind of started the whole thing, thinking also too that I didn't want to just speak for 40 minutes <laughs> you know, on Zoom. But I was thinking too, Kansas City, I mean, it's, it's music, the arts kind of follow water, kind of follow rivers and so on. And, and um, there's the Mississippi, the Arkansas, the j j jazz, you know, music, music, American music followed those tributaries up through the cities and the places that uh, the people scattered and went to. And uh, so that's kind of the heart of it or how it, the concept and so on. And, and uh, I call it a coherent shape to brokenness because maybe that's what we all do in our work as writers and poets and those who sponsor and care for uh, the act, the act of, and the creations of, of um, that move us forward as as human beings. Absolutely, I loved hearing you play your saxophone, and I was wondering how playing music shapes your writing, and how your writing affects your music. I came to poetry as uh, I didn't start writing poetry until my mid twenties. And I came to poetry really through my mother and her writing music. And she loved poetry. She only had an eighth grade education, but what she took from that was William Blake, you know, and other poets who she could quote, she could quote from. And, and her writing, her, her writing of ballads and, and, and songs followed that. So that was the start. That was kind of the start of my poetry and how I came to it. And so music, we used to have a lot of really uh, the top swing band, swing band, mem um, band members here in Tulsa, which was a center of country swing at our house. And, and uh, she used to sing. I got to see her sing with Leon McCullough. And, and that kind of started it. But I didn't start playing sax till I was almost 40. I was teaching it down at the University of Arizona, I remember. And I was playing sax, and of course, I sounded like a beginner or sax player at first and horrible. And people were saying, what are you doing? Uh, you know, one of my main mentors, a translator of mine from Italy says, you can't do that. You will ruin your poetry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like the saxophone still has a bad reputation, but it's similar. It's the same voice. You know, it's certainly, you know, just like writing, you have to keep up your your skills and, and, and a, horn's, a horn is like that, but I just see it as an extension. It's an extension of the voice and it does, uh, there's, you know, it's similar in so many ways. And with poetry, at least for me, I'm always trying to get to the place that words can't reach. And music does that, <laughs> it does that in its own way. And, and, and anyway, that's how, how it works for me. Uh, that's, I love the part where uh, the places where words can't reach. You said so many things tonight that were beautiful and important and that I want to ask you about. And I was really struck by you saying it is times like these that we face the most cunning of tricksters. And I wondered what is the particular importance of tricksters like Rabbit in story and in moments like this? Yeah, I see tricksters as a kind of clown. They can be tragic and 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 uh, astonishing clowns with words or with their actions, and they can be hilarious. That's why in so our societies and cultures all over the world, there's often a trickster right near the seat of power, or a clown near the seat of power, or a jester, something to set that that says, okay. 
uh, we have when you get so close to power and you're in power that you have it's dangerous you know it's like electrical current or holding an electric you know it's dangerous and it can go either way and so laughter or you know seeing ourselves in these kind of acts that make us laugh that enlarge our 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 foibles uh laughter dissipates and helps shift that and so yes of course and not to get real political but sometimes sometimes it's the tricksters you know in the worst and in the most cunning of strangest of times we often have tricksters sitting in the seat of power but they're usually sitting nearby to remind people that the power does not belong to them it belongs to the, it's meant to be shared it doesn't belong to one person absolutely i thinking about power and, and thinking about mapping you talked about an alternative mapping project that you are working on with the library of congress and i wondered if you could tell us a bit more about that and where we can all see these maps yes it's out it's it's running now on the library of congress site living nations living words and you know, it's a digital mapping pro i've always liked maps and so when i was uh went in for orientation as a U.S. Poet Laureate, I wanted to see, I wanted to see what was in the library. I mean, of course, it's huge and went to different departments. Of course, geography was one that I really wanted to go to and see all the different kinds of maps. So we decided, we included, they're included, the folk, uh, folk Life Center is included. And, um, but I thought it was important, one, to showcase Native poets and to say, okay, here is the country. Here are these beautiful lands. That's why we chose the map. If you go to the site, you'll see this beautiful map in blues and greens and with no political boundaries. No, none of that, all just the land. And then to hear these voices, these contemporary poets, native poets with their voices emerging and of course it's it's only the beginning we we don't have the capacity to put you know every my the original concept is let's put all the poets and then we will show you know we'll start with the indigenous poets say here we are it's not just one poet and one native poet there's there's hundreds of us and we're all over the country and we're connected that's what i wanted to show is how we were connected to each other but we're also connected to all these other poets, like I mentioned, Gwendolyn Brooks there. And, you know, you start finding out how everyone is related. I did a class once uh, on poetry ancestors, a creative writing workshop for an undergrad. And I had everybody bring, everyone bring in a poem that they loved. I said, of course, them being undergrads, I said, it can't be your own. <laughs> it has to be, you know, a poet or a poet. And then we started tracing their ancestors of those poems and they were reading poems. One of the students says, I've never read so much poetry in my life. And then we made a big map and you could see how, how you know, all the connections. And so it, the project was similar to that. Let's, well, I wanted people to realize that our voices really are connected to, to the land. I mean, you think about, you know, there's always the setting. I mean, it's everything so much you know it it it, ha it describes you know how we eat how we move about even the shape of our poetry or how we engage is so is so much uh connected to landscape and where we live and if we're living in the middle of new york city or or out in uh out in wyoming somewhere you know, it all it all, it all matters Absolutely. I love that image of the map with no geographic boundaries and no labels and no, no, no words, just poems. One of the things you said that I was so struck by was the increased hunger for poetry at this moment of this at the crossroads of brokenness, as you said it. And I wonder why do you think that is? Well, for, I mean, our certainly our lives shifted into this ability to range, to range far out from the domestic field out and, you know, attend large events, attend any events, to attend family events, and then suddenly we were mostly quarantined 
I mean, just step out, you could lose your life, you know, to something you can't see, but it's there to, you know, from somebody you don't even know this, it, you know, this great, huge unknown. And it caused us, we went inside. So in a way that we were living, I think of a poem, poems sometimes are these, you know, they, they're carriers. It could be, a poem could be a room, you know, that carries in a room, all kinds of time goes through all kinds of seasons go through people's thoughts, what they do, how they are to each other. So a poem can hold so much. And so poems are like these islands that you could travel to <laughs> or be inside and they could offer insight or even ask the questions. I don't know that we can ever answer most of our questions and poetry offered what poetry always offers at times of transformation is okay here's a moment i can live in this moment and this moment will blow me open this moment will break my heart this moment will say oh okay i can i'm here and i'm here and in this poem i can be everything for a moment or i can be nothing and absolutely love being in the nothing of nothing Oh, I love this moment will blow, blow me open, blow us open. And you spoke not just of poetry, but also of story. And there was a moment where you were um, talking about the power of dreaming to change stories. And you said something that really intrigued me. You talked about the moment that a story gains its own will to live. And I'd love for you to talk about that moment when stories develop life. What makes that happen? Well, it kind of happened in that dream. And then when I'm writing that dream, and then when that came out, you know, how it is when you're writing and it says in the story, you're so thrilled to be living, you know, <laughs> because, the, you know, what we do teaches us. And I love that. I thought, where did that come from? That is so cool that these stories have their own impetus that they want to live. So I don't, I don't know, I still think about that. But I've seen it. I, 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 I was a teenage mother and now I'm a, and a grandmother in my 30s and now a great grandmother. So it's given me a little bit of the depth of the story field and what I've watched in as these children grow. And then it's generations. Each generation is a person and kind of comes in with work to do together. And I watch how there's a persistence in storylines you can call it dna some of its dna like storylines others is you know and it's in, in dna what is it it's stories they want to live you know they 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 will they they continue and they they find their way they're they're there there's a wholeness to them one of my favorite stories i put in my memoir that will be out in september was of uh of a, a, a tribal nation in uh, from Kodiak Island who through you know through horrible horrible um, you know the Russians coming in and taking over and then blowing people up with cannonballs and lining them up and they went through almost losing almost but they were holding on with their culture they still had a few speakers they were still holding on and then the culture was built back up to to a robust living culture not teetering on the edge and someone in the past had married a trinket person and they said when the culture is robust again okay come over here we have kept some of your songs for you because now they can go back and live with you we kept them for you mm -hmm. and i love that because it tells me that you know, a lot of, you know, it's these stories continue. There's a continuum, even though it might appear things are broken. That's so powerful and beautiful. And speaking of stories, one of the things we were talking about before things began tonight was um, favorite AWP stories. And I wonder if you'd be willing to share what is a favorite AWP story or memory of yours? Oh, man, that's a that's a hard one i was thinking about awp we were talking about it too about how 
I was said, well, I was there when it started. Well, I wasn't. It turns out it started. I guess it was these gatherings that started a little bit later. And um, I don't know. It's just hearing. I like hearing people perform and read. And I also, I guess, I remember getting to hear Adrienne Rich. I remember going to Tempe, Arizona. I remember that one. And most of all, it's just seeing somebody in the hallway. <laughs> a lot of it for me is sometimes it gets so overwhelming and I miss that too, but it's running into, you know, we're on a literary road, a road, and it's often, you know, often we're uh, in our space, like the, you know, the pandemic for me has been, it's enabled me to get a lot of work done. I got a new album, <laughs> uh, the anthology and an, a memoir because it's like that kind of space and then you break out of it and awp is this it's this immense and, and incredible gathering of so many of us that often do our work in solitary mm -hmm. and then we get to hear this flowering so to speak of of um of what we've been doing and making connections and saying and then what always astounds me is that we find out in a way that everybody's kind of it Alice Walker said it for I heard it first from her is that well we're all working on the same large poem and that's what starts happening you get in circles of what are you working on what are you working on and you think you start seeing how everything links up mm -hmm. that's beautiful I love the song that was at the end of your keynote about Kansas City and you captured so beautifully the poignancy of being all together and the sweetness of that and how we're missing that and yet we are gathered together and you said something that I thought was beautiful which is gathering together is spiritual food and so for my final question for you tonight I'd love to ask you how does gathering feed us even when we're gathering virtually well it's certainly this pandemic has you know a lot of us have been thinking profoundly about that about what it provides and it is literally literally is energy i mean and that's the difficulty with the virtual i mean there is i can feel it but not like being in the room you know with everyone with everyone there but i could there's still it's still here and maybe we have to fine tune ourselves you know, fine tuners. Well, we are. We're always in a in a process of fine tuning in one way or the other. But you know, it is it is spiritual food. I mean, it, it's it's there's something about that kinetic. Um, it's breath, like sharing sharing breath. And in a way, we do that when we write. It just winds up on paper, or it winds up in in a, you know more and more in other kinds of uh, media but it is kind of sharing breath and what is that that's sharing life force that's saying okay here you know here we are you are here here i am and i realize how much we need that with each other you know music concerts the ability to sit and sit in a circle around a fire with each other and even just share a meal and a little poetry <laughs> Oh, so, so true. Well, Joy, your words and your music this evening, I know have been spiritual food for me and for every person watching. Thank you so much for that extraordinary keynote. Thank you for the gift of your words and your music and your writing in the world. It's a tremendous honor to have you um, bring us all together in this moment of shared music and shared words and shared breath across the Zoom screens. Thank you, oh, no, thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you, everyone who's watching out there from the corners near and far. Thank you for gathering story and song. Um, we're so grateful that you're with us um, at this giant gathering over 5,000 strong of writers from far and wide. Um, and we hope you all stay well and have wonderful evenings. And we'll see you at the conference tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good night.